Right, hi everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Slightly strange talking to a screen and lots of people. Um, so this evening I'm just going to go through preparation for folding um, and then we'll also move on just to signs of impending folding and what you should be looking out for. Um, so the last sort of month's checklist, uh, things you need to be thinking about are vaccinations, worming, your mare's diet, um, you need to think about removing her shoes, um, check if she's got a cassock and organise where she's going to fall down, if that's going to be at home or if you're going to send her away to the stud. Uh, so firstly, we'll just talk about where your mare's going to fall. So the options you've got, she can either fall at home with you uh, in a stable, she can fall at home in the field, or she can move to a specific folding facility, so a stud that will keep an eye on her 24-7. Sort of if she's going to move to a stud to fall down, it's ideal that she moves one month before her due date. Um, this is mainly just to minimise the stress on the mare. It will also allow the mare's immune system to respond to any pathogens in the new environment um, when she moves. Depending what studs you go to, some may require swabs for CEM, so contagious equine arthritis, um, and also bloods for EVA and EIA, so equine viral arthritis and equine infectious anemia before moving. But this is stud specific, so you need to find out if they require that or not. Um, a lot of the studs will also want up-to-date um, equine herpes virus vaccinations, um, which we will come on to later in the talk. Um, so before foaling, uh, ideally you'll get your mare in a routine. Uh, if you have decided that she's going to foal in a stable, um, then I would start bringing her in at night and monitoring her sort of two to four weeks before her due date. Um, I'd, she can still obviously be turned out, but turn her out in a small or medium-sized paddock, ideally somewhere near the stables, although it's much more likely that she's going to fold at night. Um, obviously, she can still fold during the day, so she needs to be somewhere nearby where you can keep an eye on her during the day as well. post folding initially you want a small, clean, um, safe paddock for the mare and foal, ideally near the stable. Um, it's quite important that foals don't go out in big paddocks as soon as they're born. Really, they should be turned out in small paddocks for about two weeks after they're born. Um, it's quite crucial that foals don't get too much exercise um, when they're young, because this can have effects on their joints. Preferably, you choose a paddock that's been rested prior to foaling. This is just to minimise the risk of the foal picking up any parasites. So if you are going to fold down at home in a stable, ideally, you, the stable needs to be a minimum size of a 12 by 12 foot stable. Preferably you want something a bit bigger, something more like 16 by 16 foot. Um, needs to have good ventilation, needs to be free from any drafts. Make sure there's good lighting, um, access to any electricity in case there is an emergency. There should be clean water nearby and it should be easy to clean and disinfect um, after, after it's been used. If your mare's due to fall down at sort of this time of year, it's still pretty cold at night, so heat lamps um, would be beneficial. If you do have heat lamps, you just need to be careful of overheating the stable. Um, it can also cause excess humidity, which can increase your infection risk. Uh, the ideal bedding for a mare to fall down on will be a deep straw bed. Um, this is mainly because it's just cleaner for the foal um, and the shavings often try to stick to everything. Um, if you're folding outdoors, then ideally have a small area that you can easily observe. You don't want a mare sort of folding at the end of a 20 acre field. Uh, that you can't see. There should be some sort of means of lighting uh, in case there is an emergency and you need, um, we need to get there. Ideally also a field where we can get to in our cars, so somewhere where we can ideally come if there is an emergency. Um, I would always make sure that you do have a stable available in case it's needed, whether this is because you know, the foal has an issue when it's born, it needs to be kept in a stable definitely make sure you've got something sort of prepared before she's due to foal. Um, so with her diet prior to foaling, you want to aim to increase her nutrition gradually over the last three months of foaling. There's lots of broodmare specific diets out there. Um, these will have the correct balance of minerals and vitamins for the foal's development. I'd initially follow the manufacturer's guidelines as to how much to feed. However, if the mare is getting too thin or too fat on the diet, then you need to adjust that accordingly. 
Uh, if the mare is getting too fat feeding a specific brood mare diet, then feeding a char from balancer um, is another option as well. So moving on just to the different vaccinations um, for your mare. So she should be up to date with her flu and tet vaccines. Um, she should have a booster of a flu and tetanus in the last four weeks of pregnancy. This will help just boost the antibodies in the colostrum for the foal. So we'll hope, hopefully pass on some immunity to the foal. EHV vaccines are something that should definitely be considered um, if the mare and foal are on a yard where there's horses coming and going, or if there's young horses or yearlings around, then I definitely would consider vaccinating your mare against EHV. EHV1, it causes abortions um, in mares. So there's a course of three vaccinations that you can give, and that will help reduce um, the risk of abortion for, caused by EHV1. So those vaccines are given at five months, seven months, and nine months of pregnancy. Uh, rotavirus is a cause of viral diarrhea in foals. This often affects them in the first couple of months of their life. Um, I think I would consider vaccinating against rotavirus if your foal is on a property where uh, there has been cases of rotavirus before, um, or if your foal is going to be turned out with a lot of other foals in a small space, then I'd consider vaccinating against rotavirus. Again, it's a course of three vaccinations at seven, nine, and 10 months of pregnancy. So moving on to worming. So hopefully during pregnancy, your mare's followed a structured worming plan, which hopefully your vet has given you. Um, it's important that she does stay up to date with her worming. Um, foals quite often like to eat the feces of, them, of the mares. Um, so it's important that they're not sort of congesting, ingesting a whole load of eggs. Um, the mare should get an ivermectin-based wormer in the last month um, prior to foaling. This is something like a bimectin wormer or an equivalent. Um, wormer. So some worms can also pass um, into the mare's milk. So that's why it's important to get that wormer into your mare in that last month of foaling. Um, if your mare does have shoes on, I would remove these shoes for the two to four weeks prior to foaling. This is mainly that if the mare stands in the foal, you want to just lessen the damage that could be caused. If your mare does have ongoing foot problems, then it might be worth talking to your vet or your farrier. Um, that's the only time I'd really make compromise to uh, keep shoes on the mare. So some mares require their vulva to be stitched up um, in order to help them conceive. This is because the vulval seal isn't good and air and bacteria can get into the vagina and, and that's why they can struggle to conceive. So, Sometimes we stitch the vulva lips together, which is called a caslic. It's really important that if your mare has been caslic, that the caslic is reversed before foaling. So you can see on the left picture, she's all stitched up the top, and then we just need to come and cut open, um, cut open the stitches. So if, if your mare does foal and she's got a caslic, this can cause a lot of damage to the vulva and to the anus. So, it's really important that it's checked. If you're unsure, then ask us to come and check um, because a lot of damage can be caused if it's not reversed before she falls. Uh, so this is just a little brief list as to some things that might be useful for you to have in a folding kit. So it's an antiseptic or antibiotic spray. This is so you can spray the navel uh, once the umbilicus is broken. Some towels, a thermometer, a head torch, especially if you're going to be folding in the field. Make sure you've got a charged head torch ready. A tail bandage, some disposable gloves, some string or baleen twine, a pair of scissors, a bucket for the placenta. So it's really important that when the placenta is passed that you keep this placenta, try and pick it up from the stable because the mares can sometimes tread on it and tear it and then it does make it difficult for us to assess it. Um, a phosphate enema and some KY jelly, bottle and teats, especially if your mares run milk and you have colostrum that you can then feed the foal um, when the foal's born. Uh, warm water and soap, and really importantly, a charged mobile phone and make sure your vet's phone number is saved in case there's any emergency. So just move on to when your mare's gonna foal and a few sort of signs to look out for um, as to when she might foal. So the normal gestation period 
before and there is 11 months and seven days post ovulation. So that's about 340 days. However, this is very much only a guide. The normal range of a horse is anywhere between 330 and 370 days. And if your mare is overdue, don't panic. Um, it's fine. It's, it's okay. So an overdue foal is unlikely to result in a foal that's too large. It's often due to delayed uterine development and maybe because the foal is small, that's why it's just come here a bit later. So don't panic too much. So some science to look out for, I would definitely get to know your mare's routine, get to know her behaviour. So if you are bringing her in at night to fall down and start bringing her in about two to four weeks before she's due to fall, um, you can get to know her routine. Any past information on foaling is always helpful. Sometimes mares you know, show a lot of signs of foaling, others don't at all. Sometimes they come early, sometimes they come late. So it's useful to know if there's any uh, past foaling information. Um, so often their muscles and their pelvic ligaments all relax around their tail heads um, and their vulva elongates so a bit like the bottom picture um, and this is due to a hormone called relaxin that will increase at the end of her pregnancy. Her udder will start to develop and she might wax up which is like the top picture. However waxing up is usually one of the last signs that you see before she falls. If she is waxing up, then I would be keeping a very close eye on her. It's probably that she's fairly imminent to fall. Not all mares will wax up though. It's great if they do, because it can give you a really nice indication that they'll fall soon, but not all of them will wax up. So don't wait and rely just, just, on, um, just on that. And then the composition of the milk will change. It will start to be very watery and pale. And then as she becomes near a foaling, it will turn to thick and opaque. Um, it's very much a variable time span as to when mares will show signs of foaling. Some will show signs for weeks and others might only show signs um, sort of for a few days before she's actually due to foal. And if you have a maiden mare that's not had a foal before, it, they are often a bit more unpredictable um, and it's slightly harder to, to determine when they're going to foal. If your mare has been running milk, especially in the last sort of month of her pregnancy, um, it's definitely worth talking to your vet. Sometimes it can indicate a problem. So the milk that she'll probably be running is called colostrum and it's very valuable. It's only produced once, once it's gone, it's gone and there won't be any more. So colostrum, like in the bottle on the right, it's a very thick yellow fluid. It's rich in antibodies and it has a high nutritional value to the foal. It's only produced in the last month of pregnancy. Um, and like I say, once it's gone, it's gone. So if she is running milk, then it's a good idea to try and milk her so that you can collect the colostrum. So I probably collect it in 200 or 250 mil um, bags, freeze it, um, but just make sure it's defrosted slowly. So don't put it in the microwave. When you're defrosting it, um, put it in a warm bucket of water um, so it can defrost slowly. So a few tests that we've got um, that are sort of commercially available to try and help you predict when your mare might fall. Um, a popular one is the milk test kits. This monitors changes in the milk calcium levels um, before foaling. Uh, ideally, you sample the milk from about two weeks before the due date or when the udder um, is, is developed, is noticed. Um, it takes about two mils each test. And I'd start to do it twice day, uh, once daily, and then I start sampling um, twice daily once the result goes over 100 parts per million. Um, this shouldn't have any effect on the amount of colostrum, and there have been studies done that have shown that there hasn't been any failure of passive transfer having used these kits. Um, so they are safe to use. However, if you do decide to use them, obviously milking the mare, you're opening up the teat canal. So it's just important to have really good hygiene um, just to stop any infection getting up into her udder. Um, they're very reliable at predicting when a mare is not going to fall. Um, so if the calcium is less than 200, it, there's a 98% chance that she won't fall. When the calcium starts to increase over 200 parts per million, um, then it's very likely that she's gonna fall within three days and then 84% chance that she'll fall within 48 hours and 54% chance that it will be within the 24 hours. So they're a really nice indication um, that, you know, once it goes over 200, you do need to keep a really close eye on her because she's probably pretty imminent. 
Um, here are just a few different folding alarms that can be used. So a halter monitor, this is something that goes on the horse's halter. Um, they are sensitive to when the mare lies down. You can have chest monitors, which are like in the picture on the left. So these are temperature and sweat monitors. So mares will often sweat up when they're coming into labour. Um, so these basically detect the sweat and usually alert you depending either to your phone or you have like a transmitter. Um, I think probably the most useful ones are the, the vulva monitors or stitch alarms. So these are alarms that get stitched into the mare's vulva and during labour when the water bag is passed, which Paula will come on to all of that, um, it will break the, break the alarm and this will alert you usually to your mobile phone, you can link them up. Um, they're quite useful little bits of kit. So sitting up and watching your mare, if you're going to send your mare away to a stud to fall down, often um, these studs have you know, people that work at night that are specifically there to monitor the, uh, the mares at night for foaling. Um, the majority of mares will foal at night and 53% between eight o'clock and 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, with the sort of better technology nowadays, you can actually quite easily buy cameras that you can set up in stables. Um, if you are gonna get a camera, just make sure you either get an infrared camera um, so you can have the lights off or you'll need to just have a low level of lighting um, if you've got a normal one so you can um, so you can keep an eye on it but they're quite handy they usually sort of link up to your link up to your phone so you can keep an eye on them I definitely would start watching them you know two weeks before the due date um, really start to get to know their behavior and things um, so you can sort of tell if there's any change quicker so just a few take home messages, um, watching your mare is invaluable. No test is 100%. Um, the only thing that's 100% is you keeping an eye on the mare. So be observant, be patient and wait. Uh, be prepared, know, know what you're doing, be prepared well in advance. Um, this will minimize stress on everyone. Um, problems aren't common, there's only They've uh, research said 10.1% of births um, have problems. If problems do arise, however, um, prompt attention intervention is a must. So if there's any signs there being an issue or you're worried there might be an issue, you need to just make sure you ring because um, time really is of the essence. Um, thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Okay, thank you very much, Grace. That was a really, really interesting talk. Um, we've got a few questions that people have uh, typed in, which is great. I'm just gonna pick out a few. Um, one question that's come up a couple of times is, how do you calculate the due date for a mare? Because a few people have said you talk about a month um, prior to foaling as being a, a crunch time that you start to, to plan things. Um, but what, what is your way of uh, actually calculating the due date for a mare? Um, so the best way depends sort of how your mare has been served. So if your mare has been served by uh, AI, then you should count 340 days from the ovulation date um, that you have, which is usually 11 weeks, um, 11 months, sorry, and one week. Um, if your mare's been served by natural cover and you haven't necessarily had her stand, then um, you should count it from the last day that she was covered. Um, you should count your 340 days and that should be your, be your due date. Okay. Okay, that's really good. So I work it out. I, I work out 11 months and a year. That's, that's my simple way. So if it's the 1st of April is the... Covering date, I work back 11 months and a week from that, and that gives me my due date. That's how I work it out. Um, one other question was, why do you talk about undoing the Caslix two to three weeks prior to foaling rather than leaving it right up to the last minute? Some people have questioned with the use of milk test kits and being able to predict foaling a little bit more accurately, why you might consider actually opening a mare up 
um, two or three weeks in advance of the, the date that you're expecting? Uh, yeah, no, that's a really good question. Like you say, with the milk test kits, they, um, they do give us a slightly more accurate time of foaling. However, no test is really 100% um, accurate. So although they give us a great indication, you want to make sure you're really prepared. So I definitely make sure you still open it up two to four weeks in advance, um, just in case anything were to happen. Um, it's much better to be prepared earlier rather than leaving it last minute. Um, yeah, in case in case something does happen earlier. Okay, that's cool. Um, one other question that keeps coming up is people still questioning the advantages and disadvantages of foaling in a stable compared to foaling in the field. Have you got any more to add beyond what you've already talked about in your discussion? Um, I think really the main thing is it's much easier to observe a horse in a stable than it is to observe a horse in the field. You know, she's much more likely to foal at night. Um, and it's quite difficult if you're going around the field to see what she's doing. You know, you're obviously going to disturb her. Um, you're probably going to be wandering around with a torch. Um, so it's just much easier to keep an eye on her in a stable um, in a sort of controlled environment. And also if you did need help. Um, if there was an issue, um, it's much easier for us to sort of deal with that in a stable rather than trying to find you in a field. I, I guess one of the other things is the time of year, isn't it? You know, if it's if it's nice and warm and sunny and the, the nights are quite short because it's the middle of summer, it, it makes life a little bit easier to check them out in the field. Um, what are your thoughts on m mares that are wearing rugs? Um, what, what are your thoughts on whether or not mares should be should be wearing rugs around the time of foaling? Um, I think ideally no rugs. Um, you know, it's just an added an added complication in there. Um, obviously, it does depend on what time of year we're talking. You know, if we're talking it's freezing and snowing, then she might need a rug on. But I'd imagine she's probably wintered out um, without a rug. Um, a lot of them. So I would try and avoid rugs if you can. Okay. We have got an awful lot of questions coming in, which is really, really nice to see that people are so interested. Um, however, unfortunately we can't answer them all. We would love to be able to do that. One question that keeps coming up 